Hello, BookTube. Well, it's Tuesday, and that ordinarily means Tag Tuesday uh, here on BookTube, where we where we do the tags that are out and about and going around. Uh, but as far as I could tell, in 2021, I might not be seeing things quite 100% clearly yet, but as far as I could see, there was only one tag that I had sort of outstanding where I was actually tagged, uh, as opposed to jumping on a bandwagon or making a tag of my own, and that was the uh, problematic faves tag, which is so utterly infuriating that I don't think I could even read the questions, much less answer them, without just degenerating into rage-fueled yelling. <laughs> so so I'm not going to do that. I think one of you tagged me in that, but I'm, I'm obviously not going to do it. It's it's just fascistic lunacy. Uh, which left me with the question, if I'm not going to do that, and if I don't know of any other tags extant that I'm, that I'm tagged in, then what do I do on this tag Tuesday? I thought I would read to you again, uh, because I really enjoyed that. And I have the occasion here, because the other day, I went to the Brattle Bookshop here in Boston, and I found this. An Introduction to Birds by John Kieran. Uh, John Kieran was a newspaper man. He was a sports columnist. He was uh, a guest uh, on a very popular radio information show that, uh, along the lines of uh, of What's My Line or whatnot. That was it was he was on that nine months a year. Uh, he became a popular personality. He was known to all, uh, to authors and sports giants and whatnot, everybody in publishing, and loved by most people. A really wry, smart, wonderful guy. And uh, when I got this book at the Brattle, this is this was a hit for him when he did this. Uh, I mentioned that all of his stuff is out of print. That that you you know all all the books that he wrote because he 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 ended up writing quite a bit not only collecting all of his sports columns but also writing about nature uh he developed a a, a regular column uh of walking around in nature because he developed a regular habit of walking around in nature and then writing about it, it turned out to be really good at it so uh, publishers liked it and I mentioned that all that stuff was out of print. I mentioned also that, just offhandedly, that he had also written an autobiography of sorts, a kind of look-back memoir at his own life, uh, called Not Under Oath, that was also out of print. And one of you, <laughs> one of you found it and sent it to me. And the guilty party has already come forward and confessed here. <laughs> uh, but uh, I naturally reread this thing. I haven't read, I don't think I'd read the whole thing ever. I just sat down and sank into this author's company again, and I thought I would share a little bit of it with you, since it's unlikely that you're going to come across this author any other way. Uh, so I, I thought I'd start with, uh, the, the, the book really captures the two sides of those two sides that I mentioned. I mean, there's the, the newspaper man, the, the rough and tumble newspaper man who wrote sports columns. Uh, and there's a great anecdote in here about how he got that job about how he became first a golf columnist, <laughs> a golf reporter. Uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to read a little bit from the beginning here about how he got into the newspaper world just in general. Uh, naturally, it struck a chord with me. Everybody who's ever had any time in the newspaper world, especially the old newspaper world, when that was not done, where there was no internet. Uh, well, all, all, everybody will have a story about how they, <laughs> they managed to get into that world. And this is his. After giving the matter a little thought, I decided to become a newspaper man. Like everybody else, I believed that I could write if I had a chance, but unlike most other young fellows looking for jobs as reporters, I knew a man who could turn the trick for me. He was the late Frederick Birchall, the bustling, bald, and red-whiskered assistant managing editor of the New York Times. He had been a simple uh, family friend for years, and I felt he couldn't refuse my simple request for a job as a reporter. <laughs> I was right. Uh, when I saw him at the Times office, he gave in more or less gracefully and welcomed me into the newspaper world with these encouraging words. Oh, very well. <laughs> Come back in three weeks and I'll put you in, in as a district man. But I'll tell you two things. First, you won't like the work. And second, you'll never be any good at it. <laughs> That's a, a lot of people have anecdotes like that. Uh, and then I have another one here that I want to give you that shows the other side of it, which is his, his love of nature, his... Uh, his love of nature and his ability to read about nature. Uh, let's see here. Uh, one thing I learned was the everlasting beauty of the night skies. So that for years now, it has been a fixed habit with me to go out of the house just before I go to bed at night 
for a last look upward in the dark. Even if it's raining or snowing, I do it. It can be spectacularly enchanting when the wind is up and the moon is, quote, a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. But best all is the clear night when the stars have the dark canopy overhead to themselves. You can almost hear them sparkle. When I walk out on such a night, I orient myself according to the season. In our latitude, we always have most of the Big Dipper above the horizon pointing the way to the North Star, but that is not what I look for. On my own lawn, I have, th uh, I have that direction fixed in mind. Furthermore, if the Big Dipper is well down, Cassiopeia is up and serves just as easily as a reference point or astronomical benchmark. When Orion slides down the western sky and Castor and Pollux ride high overhead as I go to bed, I know that spring isn't far away. Soon Regulus, anchor star of the sickle, will be bright in the eastern evening sky, and red wings and robins will be flocking back from the south. Arcturus, easily found by following the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper southward across the night sky, is the climbing star that presides over the warbler migration in May. Then my stars of the late spring and long summer come on, not one by one, but in groups, the lovely Corona Borealis and the great triangle made by Vega in Lyra, Deneb and Cygnus and Altair and Aquila. You have a choice with Deneb. It can be either on the top of the northern star or a tail end of the swan, Cygnus, forever flying southward across the August nights. As summer slips by away, the night air takes on a chill and katydids and crickets fall, fill the dark fields and woods with incessant chirping. The great square of Pegasus slowly hauls up to the zenith with Andromeda seemingly caught on the lower hand left corner floating along like a trailing garment of starry texture. There are some clear-eyed persons who can spot the great nebula in Andromeda without help of any kind, but I need field glasses to find it. Autumn is the time of great nights and great days. Let the poets sing of spring. The English and their other European bards have good reason for it. That's their best season. But in New England, spring is a hard word. <laughs> Autumn in New England, that's the ticket. There is no brighter or finer season anywhere in the world. The colors by hill and dale are overwhelming. The air is clear, sharp, stimulating. Blue skies are reflected in blue waters. The sunsets over a landscape of red and gold are incredibly brilliant. The moonlight nights, first the happy harvest moon, then the nippy hunter's moon, are enchanting. And he goes on like that. He can go on like that for long stretches at a time. Uh, right in the middle of... of uh, of quippy and sarcastic anecdotes. So it makes this book a delight to read. The The guilty person has already come forward to, to tell me who sent this. And I don't want to read, I don't want this reading to be an encouragement for anybody to send me anything else. <laughs> but I thought I would read from this because it was uh, in this rare instance. I say don't send me a book. But in this rare instance, it was a delight. <laughs> it was a bullseye. Uh, so there you go. That's a little John Kieran for you today. Instead of tag for Tuesday, we'll see if there if there are any tags that crop up that I missed or if I'm reminded of any. I don't have to wait till Tuesday to do them. So I'm going to sign off for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.